Welsh romantic novelist, Martin Luther King Jr., the great American civil rights activist, said, I've decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. Three, hate can be famous quotations about love. What does our William Shakespeare have to say about love within his romantic comedy, Much Ado About Nothing? Well, stay tuned, because you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Much Ado About Nothing may well be described as a comedy about love, but the opening scene to the play contains some hilariously negative views about love and marriage. A feisty woman known as Beatrice, Leonardo's niece, declares bluntly, I'd rather hear my dog bark at a crow than a man swear he loves me. The sound of a dog barking is piercing and unpleasant, whilst crows are dirty, scavenging creatures. And so this comparison emphasises Beatrice's total lack of interest in receiving a proposal from a man, and therefore love itself. Now, as we will discover later, Beatrice is the kind of woman who enjoys a verbal battle, who hates flattery, and seems to have developed a role for herself as a stalwart warrior against love and marriage. Nonetheless, it is interesting that in this play, opinions against love are heard before feelings of love. Shakespeare shows how love is in the eye of the beholder. Beauty that prompts someone to fall in love can leave other observers baffled, bemused, bewildered. Claudio is a dashing young man, so young that he's referred figuratively by a messenger as a lamb, but so brave and strong that in the recent triumphant battle he performed the feats of a lion. In the first scene of the play, after Beatrice's withering comments, he gushes about the beauty of Hero, Leonardo's daughter. He ponders dreamily, can the world buy such a jewel? The use of the metaphor jewel is a common one in Shakespeare. In the play Romeo and Juliet, Romeo uses the image when he first catches sight of Juliet at the Capulet Ball and eulogises about her beauty being like a rich jewel in the Ethiop's ear. The imagery highlights the precious, valuable impression the men have quickly formed of the respective women. It suggests their beauty is dazzling, like an expensive precious stone. It glimmers so your eye can't stop looking at it. However, jewels can also be bought, albeit at vast expense, and are worn to add to the status of the wearer, thus hinting at the comparative lack of control women had in choosing partners in Elizabethan England. So one man can be left overcome by another woman's beauty, whilst another is left gobsmacked, completely unable to understand what the fuss is all about. In response to Claudio's delighted descriptions, Benedict says, as bluntly as Beatrice, I can see yet without spectacles, and I see no such matter. He then goes on to say, There's her cousin, and she were not possessed with a fury, exceeds her as much in beauty as the first of May, doth the, doth the last of December. By referring to the quality of his own eyesight, Benedict comically questions both Claudio's ability to see clearly and Hero's appearance. His imagery also contains a hint about his own preferences, should he ever fall in love, which he vows he won't. The 1st of May is the glorious period between spring and summer when nature is coming alive and flowers are blossoming. To his mind, Beatrice's beauty represents this period of time, whilst heroes relate only to the darkness, cold and frost of winter, a season when much of nature is hibernating or dead. But of course, the fact that we are all attracted to different people is the reason so many of us are able to procreate. Shakespeare knows this, but squeezes maximum comic value out of two men's completely different views, both on love and what constitutes beauty. For Benedict isn't just able to see Hero's appeal, he also can't fathom out the attraction of love and marriage at all. One thing in particular concerns him, whether a married woman can be trusted to remain faithful. He rails, that a woman conceive me, I thank her. That she brought me up, I likewise give her most humble thanks. 
but that I will have a retreat winded in my forehead or hang my bugle in an invisible baldric, all women should pardon me. Married men whose wives had committed adultery were known informally as cuckolds. Cuckolds were traditionally symbolised as having horns on their heads to represent their humiliating status as a betrayed husband. And Benedict makes numerous witty references to this in this quotation. A recheat is a hunting call played on the horn. A bugle is a horn itself, whilst an invisible baldric was a shoulder belt to hang a sword or bugle in. Benedict's feelings are clear, although his tone remains witty and light-hearted. Being sexually betrayed as a husband is not something he is prepared to tolerate. And so, he will fall in love with no woman. So people have different opinions about what constitutes beauty, which in turn can prompt feelings of love and passion. Falling in love and marrying needs a huge investment in trust, and men feel vulnerable to the relatively unknown hunger of female sexuality. But Much Ado About Nothing also sees groups of people, largely men, ganging up together to smooth pathways to love and conquest. Claudio's relative youth is emphasised when he agrees to his older, more experienced friends, the Prince Don Pedro, wooing hero on his behalf. The Prince gallantly volunteers, If thou dost love fair hero, cherish it, and I will break with her, and with her father, and thou shalt have her. Was not to this end that thou begans to twist so fine a story? In Elizabethan society, unlike the majority of cultures nowadays, having a father's consent would have been considered a prerequisite to a marriage, and Don Pedro shows his understanding of this in his voyeuristic offer to his friend. Yet is there not something slightly uncomfortable in a man allowing another to court, to flatter what he hopes will become his life partner? As it happens, there will be a celebratory masked ball that evening, allowing opportunities for disguise and deception. Don Pedro says that he will assume Claudio's part in some disguise and tell fair hero that I am Claudio and in her bosom I'll unclasp my heart and take her hearing prisoner with the force and strong encounter of my amorous tale. In other words, there is nothing personalised, nothing particular to how Claudio loves Hero, leaving it absolutely fine for another man to feign to pretend feelings of passion in order to win her love. So in Much Ado, love can be built upon an initial deception, can be set up conveniently by two men for one of them's benefit, and the woman too, if she's lucky, but this is not considered a priority. All of us have idealised expectations about the physical appearance and attributes of future loved ones, and the characters in Much Ado are no different. In Act 2, Scene 1, Beatrice quibbles that she could not endure a husband with a beard on his face, I had rather lie in the woollen. In other words, a man's beard would be so itchy and unpleasant that sleeping with uncomfortable, scratchy blankets directly on her would be preferable to lying next to a bearded man. This line seems to suggest that Beatrice would like a future husband to be clean-shaven, as her uncle proposes. However, once again, Beatrice finds cause to quibble. What should I do with him? Dress him in my apparel and make him my waiting gentlewoman? He that have a beard is more than a youth, and he that have no beard is less than a man. And he that is more than a youth is not for me, and he that is less than a man, I am not for him. After ruling out bearded men, Beatrice promptly rules out clean-shaven ones as well, arguing they are not manly enough, too feminine, hence the joke that they should put on her clothing. So, although all of us have hopes about how our future partners should look, whether they are met is another matter altogether. Beatrice's specifications are so awkward and impossible that it suggests once again that love is not something she is prepared to contemplate at this stage in her life. She confirms this when she conjures up the idea of her in heaven, having remained unmarried as a maid, where she would chat with the bachelors as merry as the day is long. For in Beatrice's case, she may rail against marriage, but she most certainly enjoys the company and the repartee of men, as shown in her positive adjective to describe their companionship, merry. Shakespeare shows that your status within your family can affect your options in love. Beatrice appears to be an orphan, with just her uncle, Leonardo, to act as her guardian. Her cousin, Hero, however, is Leonardo's only child and heir, and so has the family name and honour to carry solely on her shoulders. Beatrice recognises this, saying that 
it is my cousin's duty to make curtsy and say father as it please you. But yet for all that cousin, let him be a handsome fellow or else make another curtsy and say father as it pleases me. These words show that Beatrice doesn't oppose marriage in general terms and accepts that a high level of daughterly obedience is a natural component of the way their society operates. The second half of her sentence, father, as it pleases me, gives Hero a tentative option to go against her father's choice, an option Leonardo doesn't give her. He tells her less playfully and more explicitly, daughter, remember what I told you, if the prince do solicit you, in that kind, you know your answer. The phrase, you know your answer, suggests that Hero's answer has been given to her and it is one she is expected to deliver, i.e. she does as she's told. Leonardo has been given incorrect information that Don Pedro plans to court Hero and is understandably pleased at the prospect. Don Pedro is a prince of high standing in society and class really mattered in Shakespeare's day. Hero could not simply marry whoever she wanted. She would need to marry a nobleman to bring honour to and uphold the family name. And so, instinctive feelings of love are arguably sacrificed at an Elizabethan altar which allowed men to dictate the terms of their daughter's future happiness and life partner. Hero needs to follow exactly what her father dictates. And if she can love the man in due course, so much the better, but obedience and adherence to expectations is considered far more important. In a society which ostentatiously forbade sex before marriage, it is no surprise that men can be impatient once a marriage has been approved in principle for it to go ahead. Although Leonardo was expecting Don Pedro to approach him about Hero, it transpires that he is equally happy for Claudio to marry her, both are of good social standing and pedigree, although Don Pedro is unquestionably Claudio's superior. Love and lust therefore push Claudio to request for the wedding to take place the very next day. In Act 2, Scene 1, he proposes, Tomorrow, my lord, time goes on crutches, till love have all his rights. The personification of time suggests that lovers, or at any rate men, can feel physically disabled, struggle even to walk, until they have been able to cement and consummate their relationship. Rights refers not just to the rights of the wedding ceremony, but also the right of two married people to make love to each other. So feelings of love and lust result in Claudio making an impossible demand. How can the wedding of the only daughter of a man of high repute be organised in 24 hours? It is impossible, and Leonardo rightly blocks this proposal, instead granting a week's preparation. And this week's preparation gives the intelligentsia of Messina the opportunity to plan and plot another love match. Just as deception suggested by a man plays a leading role in bringing Hero and Claudio together, Don Pedro disguises himself as Claudio at the masked ball. So here deception is planned to bring two remarkably well-suited people together who are permanently at loggerheads, Benedict and Beatrice.